So I am here today with some members of an awesome charity called Benetech. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves and tell us about your roles at your organization? So hello, my name is Dr. Lisa waters -Vern. I am the Senior Program Manager for Education Research and Partnerships for both um, Bookshare, which we'll speak with you about in a few minutes, as well as the Diagram community. And I'm Brad Turner, and I run Global Literacy here at Benetech, which includes Bookshare uh, and an initiative we have called Born Accessible. Um, do you want to start out by talking about your Bookshare initiative and what that is and how many countries it, it's currently in? Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, let me let me start even at a higher level. Benetech is a um, a social uh, organization. We're, we're really a high tech company, but working on high tech for social good. And so that means that we um, solve problems for underserved populations. A lot of times where for profit companies won't step in and, and solve those problems. Um, there, there's a couple places. There's a human rights program that we have. Um, we also have a um, labs initiative, which is kind of looking for that next big thing. And then um, our, our largest initiative is our global literacy initiative, which includes Bookshare and the Diagram Center, which Lisa will talk about, and Born Accessible. And, and, um, and the Bookshare portion of that is the largest online library for people who are uh, blind, visually impaired, uh, dyslexic or have a mobility impairment. So if you can't hold the book, can't see the book, or can't decode the book, you can qualify for Bookshare under um, a special copyright uh, copyright law exemption. So we have members in 80 countries. We have books in 34 languages. We have about 600,000 titles. Um, we uh, have distributed over 12 million books to people all around the world that wouldn't otherwise be able to read if we didn't provide them the books the way that, that we do. So, so we can provide books in um, an audio format, but we also provide them in a, a online braille, electronic braille format, uh, in a large print, and even in a karaoke style reading where the words highlight at the same time that they are voiced so that someone with a learning disability like dyslexia can follow on a word by word basis and and still get the content. So that's that's sort of book share in a nutshell, working with, um, you know, 500,000 students across the country and then and then others um, around the world. That's great. And I think I've heard you say before, and you're very meticulous in how they're translated too, correct, to make sure that every word is is the same across all languages. A absolutely, we get um, we get about uh, we have about 850 publisher partnerships. These are you know the, the the big five publishers. You know the Penguin Random House and Harper Collins. I mean the the, the household names, the um, university presses, uh, education publishers. We all of these publishers donate books to us. We convert them into all those different formats. Um, and put them in the library. So those are the kind of the publisher quality books. We also promise a student that if they search for a book that we don't have and request it from us, we will go either source that from a publisher or we'll buy it and chop it and scan it. So we actually chop the, the spine off the book and scan it. But, you know, 99% accuracy on a scanned book is is not enough. So we send that book out, that scanned copy out to get it proofed so that we can get, you know, virtually 100% accuracy on that book before we put it in the library. So, so again, of our 600,000 books, probably 90% of them now are, are publisher driven books, but the 10% that we have that are scanned copies are all excellent copies. Um, when, when you look at the quality of the, of the scan, Super important um, when you're trying to read a book or learn from it. If you're just doing a little bit of research, you can you can put up with some errors. If you're trying to learn math or read Romeo and Juliet or 
um, you know, even pleasure eating like, uh, you know, uh, Huckleberry Finn, that, you know, that, that accuracy is really, really important. So how hard is it to translate like a mathematical or a technical book? You know, um, Harry Potter now is pretty easy. It's got chapter titles, it's got page numbers, it's got a table of contents, um, you know, using a, a, someone with a visual impairment using a screen reader can page through that, um, jump to the chapter they want to read, etc. cetera. Uh, sixth grade science is super hard um, because there's images and callouts and diagrams and, and columns and uh, formulas and equations and charts. And, and so the, the next kind of frontier, and, and Lisa can talk about the diagram, so the next frontier is everything beyond text. My screen reader can read text pretty easily. What my screen reader can't do is read the text that's embedded in an image or give you the context of an image if you're trying to describe it. And, and so that goes for all kind of STEM, and I'm going to call it STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, you know, the, the formulas and equations that you see in a chemistry um, textbook or the picture of the Mona Lisa in an art history book. Those are those are critical and and really difficult to um, remediate books for because a lot of times with its artwork the the author has the context. If it's um, math equations or formulas or charts or graphs, they, each of those have their their different challenges. And so so Bookshare is great at remediating you know, seven to 10,000 books a month that come into the collection. <clears throat> and, and we'll actually automatically look at those books and ensure that they have accessibility features built in. For example, a table of contents. If it's, if it's not marked as a table of contents in the HTML, we will automatically change that HTML to make sure that it's marked as a table of contents, which means the screen readers can then use it as a table of contents and be able to jump to pages or jump to chapters. So we do that all programmatically. It's when you get into the harder stuff, the science, the STEAM stuff, right? That's where the Diagram Center has really made great strides. Right, and so the Diagram Center, um, we, we basically pick up where Bookshare leaves off, right? As, as Brad mentioned, Harry Potter's pretty easy, but that's because there's not images in there that we need to, to be able to access in order to really understand what's going on. So when you think about that chart or that graph or even a strand of DNA, right? how do you describe that to someone who has no frame of reference as to what that means? You may say it's uh, two ladders twisted, but for someone who's blind, what does that twist mean? Is it twisted in half? Is it twisted side to side? And so we really wanted to tackle that challenge to look at you know, how do we explain or how do we provide access to people who need a little bit more help? And so what we what we did is we thought, well, you know what, with the rise of 3D printers and the availability of um, having access to them either through makerspaces or libraries or even in their schools, maybe if we provide that 3D printed version of that object, people will understand the content much more meaningfully than they would by just reading about it alone. And so, you know, we, we targeted um, populations who are blind or low vision and said, hey, what do you think? And people said, yes, yay, now I get it, right? Like this, I've heard about this my whole life. This is the first time I get what this looks like. And then we started talking to kids with learning disabilities who said, you know, when I see that image in a book, it looks like a bunch of lines that just go everywhere. It, they don't understand that it has a backside, right? And that it's actually rotating. So then that 3D printed tactile then became important for them. And then we talked to kids without disabilities at all who said, you know what, I get it better. I get it more yeah. when I can actually touch it and feel it and manipulate it. And so that's sort of how we started a lot of our work around um, having manipulatives. But we've also done a lot of work around long descriptions, right? So when you have an image in a book, oftentimes a screen reader will just get to that picture and either skip it or say image. So if we could work together to, to build in a, a, an accurate description of what it is in that image that is meaningful for that learner, that student now has more access to information than they ever have. And so, you know, this goes beyond tactiles, this goes beyond manipulatives, this could be technology that's currently built in your current devices. Um, Google phones have haptic feedback already built into their phones where when you touch it, it might vibrate and tell you. Can you imagine a world where you're reading a chart and if your finger goes off the line or off the axis, it stops buzzing. But when it does buzz, you know you're following the chart. 
Or what about sonification? So using sound to indicate um, a curve. And so this is usually where I embarrass myself the most. But when you're talking about a bell curve, right? What if you had sound that went along with that curve that went, ooh, right? That you can understand at that at the, the top, it made a higher pitch sound than it would at the bottom. How does it go? Yeah, I told you, I embarrassed myself. Anyway, so um, you know, I think that technology is moving in such a way that it's opening up doors and opportunities for students to access information in a way that they weren't able to before. And the Diagram Center really looks to um, experts in the field, many of you who are watching this may actually be those experts, to say, hey, this is the newest technology and how can we apply it for accessibility? The Google Making in Science Journal application actually does exactly the noises you did for the bell curve. Like when they record data on their phone, it, when it, you play it back, you can have tones for the, for the different parts. So is, oh, there's a lot of makers that watch this channel. Are there anything that we could make for your community that would help? Um, any 3D printed models that would help? Or are there ways for them to connect with schools or libraries that might not have 3D printers themselves so they could print things out and work with the schools? So absolutely. So a few years ago, we received a grant um, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to look at that problem, right? Libraries were becoming a hub for makers. And oftentimes the makers were making Yoda heads, which are great and fun, but how many Yoda heads can you have around your house, right? And so what we started talking about with the libraries and the museums and the schools were, where are the intersections between the work that people are passionate about and the work that needs to be done? And so thinking about kids with disabilities, there's a few different ways that makerspaces and makers could help. Number one is involving the person that you're designing something for in that process. So not all 3D printers are accessible. They're hot. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, if you touch it in the wrong place, you could be seriously hurt. And, and the software as well. The software as well is not always the most accessible. So if you think about a blind person who needs something made, how can they work together, right? And so um, could you create an object? And, and I use that example um, of a blind person, but it can go for any person who learns a little differently. But we went to Thingiverse and found a plant cell and printed it off for one of our, um, one of our advisors. And she's blind and said, you know, this is great, but there's a lot of information here. There's too much information. Could we minimize this and maximize that? Would it change the integrity of this cell or would it communicate to me what I needed? And what we did at the next step then is we actually went back to clay and used some Play-Doh and said, okay, now what would we want it to look like? It's that next step. So when we got to that point where she found a happy medium for what she knew that object to look like, for then a designer to take that object and either scan it or create it from scratch so that we can then have it in a printable format so that now we can print it in 3D, in, with 3D material and that person can use it to learn. So there's definitely opportunities um, for that. There's also, um, you know, as I said, inclusive opportunities. Imagine um, a class at school that you know, is making things that want to be meaningful. What if a teacher needed an object to teach a science material? What if you needed that strand of DNA? You know, the teacher may not have the time to actually go to the printer, design it, create it, watch it, make sure that it, the print doesn't fail, you know, and make sure that it all works. But what if the class could do it? And so there's definitely opportunities within schools themselves and within the community to open up opportunities to design meaningfully meaningful objects, things that people could use and people can learn from. Are there other ways that people can volunteer or help out your organization through either um if they're makers or if they're, there's a lot of online educational people that are probably watching this video too. Are there any ways that they could help? Yeah, there, there, there are a, a ton of different ways. Um, we, despite the fact that we get, you know, 90% of our books from publishers, we still go out and have to procure books for students and, and chop and scan those books. Um, we also have a volunteer list where if uh, you know any of our adult members or international members, um, the funding that we get from the Department of Education doesn't cover books that we procure and chop and scan and proof for people um, who aren't students. And so we have a group of volunteers that go through and um, there's some of them that, that have a scanner and so they'll chop the spine off and, and scan the book. There's others that will go through and proof that book to make sure that the words are all correct. Um, so we, we actually run a volunteer organization here that we would love to have your educators, anybody, you know, be able to spend, whether it's a few hours, whether it's a few hours a week, whether it's a bunch of time, 
um, you know, adding uh, books to the collection because because there are a ton of books that that we don't have. There were about a million books published last year. We added a hundred thousand of them. Our there, there are other libraries who do what we do. They added, you know, two to four thousand. So we are well ahead of the game, but we're still only adding ten percent. And so the ability to add the books that people are requesting is becomes very important, right? And and um, and so volunteers can can definitely help with that. And and on the diagram side, going back to the three D printing, <laughs> as we've seen, you know, we we've seen a lot of the printers in the schools, but again, sometimes the teachers don't have the time to actually invest in in creating and printing, and and that's another opportunity for for volunteering as well is either. Um, partnering with a teacher who needs something actually printed for their student to use in the classroom or designing things. So going back to that plant cell, you know, how do we design accessible objects that could be included in a repository or registry that teachers could access? So that's another opportunity for, um, for your makers out there who are interested in using their design skills um, you know, to really open up opportunities for kids in the classroom to access STEM materials or STEAM materials um, that they may not have had access to otherwise. I mentioned a, what's called a Born Accessible Initiative. You know, we added 100,000 books to the collection last year. We, we have the largest library for people with print disabilities uh, in, anywhere in the world. The, the thing we're trying to do most over the next five years, and, it will, and we'll, it'll take longer than this, but, but we're trying to put that out of business. And, and we're doing that through this initiative we call Born Accessible, which is really working with publishers to get them to publish accessibly in the first place. If a book can be born digital, and nobody typesets anymore, everybody's using Adobe InDesign and Word and all those. If a book can be born digital, then it can be born accessible. And so we're working with publishers to get them to make the necessary changes within their production workflow. For example, make sure that table at the front of the book is actually labeled in the HTML as a table of contents. Little things like that can make that book accessible not only that, I, I would submit that that book is better for everybody. If, if it's a student with disabilities that wants to um, uh, read the book by seeing the words highlighted at the same time they listen to it, that, and that helps them, that's the best, right? That's why we get out of bed in the morning. But if there's an AP student studying that same material, and they're cramming for an exam and they want to go through and read that chemistry book one more time, now they're getting that information through multiple channels, both audio and visual. So, so it's really a better experience for all students. Um, and so, so that's sort of the Born Accessible initiative. Um, you know, you, you have educators, uh, educational YouTube um, YouTubers, Boy, getting that word out that says, hey, make sure you look for books that are um, certified by Benetech or Global Certified Accessible. We have, a, we have a certification program. Make sure that schools know that Bookshare is a free resource for students. Make sure that when procurement offices are buying books, they're looking for books that are accessible. That starts to, to really put the pressure on the publishers to build books that way and and in that case, everybody wins. When those books are published in a born accessible fashion, everybody, including students with disabilities and students without, have a better better piece of material. And as we see those digital books, you know, the collection of digital books grow, imagine a world where you could actually access the information in the way that works for you. Yeah. So one student may need a video, another student may need a tactile, another student may need sound. And so, um, you know, again, building on that Born Accessible initiative, making sure that these things are built correctly so that everybody accesses things in the way that works for them. And whether you're building a website or putting, um, building a book, having the alternative text you're talking about is helpful for everyone because then it's, everything's more searchable. So if you're looking for something, it's going to be a lot easier to find that too. No question. No question. Yeah, and tag your stuff, right? If you're creating things that are accessible, please tag it so that people can find it. We'd love to have, you know, more, we'd love to have searches that are more meaningful for people who are looking to help their students. Are there some good tags that people could follow or search for? You know, I think it depends on the need. Um, you know, I'm not the expert on accessibility metadata, um, 
but there, there are some resources on uh, a couple different websites. Um, if you go to the Benetech website and look for accessible publishing, there are some documents there. Create accessible. There's a, a reference to uh, from a from a pure publisher standpoint. There's a reference to the um, what's called the Book Industry Study Group Quick Start Guide. So it's a Quick Start Guide to Accessible Publishing. So we have it kind of. The, the Create Accessible is really for teachers who are building documents for their classrooms. The uh, Quick Start Guide for Teachers is, I'm for, for publishers, is all about um, creating books in a publishing workflow that's, that's, that are created in an accessible fashion. So um, a lot of that information is contained in some documents on, on the Benetech website if you, if you go look for um, Create Accessible and, and the Born Accessible Initiative. Um, would you mind sharing just maybe one or two stories about some of your favorite learning experiences like um, with either one learner or a group of learners? I have a story that I like to tell only because we've known this family for quite a long time. Now, this is not on the diagram side, but more of the bookshare side. Um, there was a student and when he, you know, he was struggling. Um, he has dyslexia and the school wanted to place him in special ed. And the mom said, you know what, let's just work with him. Let's get him what he needs. They, um, they were reading him books every night at dinner. She tells stories about how she stirred the pasta pot while she'd be reading his work. Um, not only would mom and dad be reading, but grandma and grandpa, and, you know, multiple family members would be part of this. It was, it was definitely a fam. It impacted their entire family. And um, they found Bookshare. And now this student is um, a junior at Cornell. And he's, um, I think he's number two in his class. He's pretty, he's doing pretty well, doing great. right? And so it just showed how Bookshare, just having access to books in a way that worked for him, he was now able to go to his room and study and not have to rely on his parents to read to him. Um, he studied for his uh, SATs using Bookshare resources. And so it just really goes to show that how, you know, because he's been a member of Bookshare so long, just the potential that this student had and how he was able to really accomplish his goals and his dreams, um, all through being able to just access books in a way that worked for him. That um, I was at a conference and a parent came up to a table um, and my the colleague that I was with said, can I help you? And she said, I'll wait. And I thought, uh-oh. Um, I figured we were going to get blasted because of something we had done. And I finished with the, the person I was talking to in turn and said, you know, my name is Brad Turner. How, how can I help you? And she said, I just want to say thank you. My daughter just finished her first year at Williams College and got 35 of her 37 books from Bookshare um, wow. and is so excited to read, you know, other books that her teachers have written. Uh, and, and this is a, you know, her daughter was there with her, blind student who was at one of the top educational institutions in the country and getting all of her material from Bookshare. So uh, super inspirational. Do you want to tell that one other story about the, um, the DNA strand? Uh, it's sure. It's, it's sort of similar to what I shared earlier, right? So we were, um, we were presenting my spiel on the Diagram Center and, and 3D printing and using that double helix as an example. And as we did that, we passed the helix around the room. And there was a woman in the back of the room um, who all of a sudden she just gasped. And so we stopped because we didn't know what had happened. And what she, what we heard her say in the back was, I have heard about this double helix my entire life. Right. And she's, um, probably about our age. Yeah. yeah. So real young. And so, um, she said, I've heard about this my entire life. This is the first time I actually could see it because she was blind and she just never had her, you know, she never was able to really put it together as to what it looked like. And, you know, it was really meaningful for us because we really got to, yeah. a chance to see someone that we weren't, we weren't testing. We were just giving a presentation and her, her response was so impressive that she, she held it up and she said, I see it now. Yeah. I've never seen it before, but now I see it. And it was, it, man, it gave everybody in the room got chills. It was it was such a cool experience. So still get chills when we talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I wanted to reach out to you guys because you just seem to really empower learners to take hold of their own learning journey, and uh, I just love that from whether it's books or giving them actual physical objects to to learn. Um, is there anything else that you would like people to know about your organization? You know, for for us, it's about making sure the the reading material is available in the right place 
in the right time on the right device in the way they need to in the way they need to read it. You know, if there's a blind student with an iPhone in their pocket and they are sitting on a bus headed home, um, I want to be able to deliver a uh, you know a book there. If there's a you know a student with dyslexia who's uh, at the library and is studying for a chemistry exam, I want to be able to deliver a book there, right? I it 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 doesn't matter to us what the print disability is, we want to be able to deliver that book in the way they want to read it so they become successful. That's what it's all about for us. And if any of your, um, any of the people watching this want to volunteer for Bookshare, helping that chop and scan process, mm -hmm. right? Um, they can email us at volunteer at bookshare.org and we would love to have, we'd love to connect them with some resources that need to be uh, put into our collection. All right, thank you guys. Thank you very much, this was great. Yeah.